Hello, this is Andrew Shore from the Washington Hospital Center in Washington, D.C. with your Pulmonary and Critical Care Literature Review for the month of January. There are two articles I'd like to discuss at this point, both focusing on infections of the lung parenchyma or various types of pneumonia. The first, by Venditti et al., was published in Annals in January, and it looked at the issue of healthcare-associated pneumonia. The concept of healthcare-associated pneumonia was recently developed to capture the fact that healthcare technology has diffused beyond the hospital. As a result, patients now present to the hospital or to the emergency department and are classified when they have pneumonia as community acquired, but in fact they have pathogens such as MRSA and Pseudomonas that more closely resemble those seen in traditionally hospital acquired syndromes like hospital acquired pneumonia or ventilator associated pneumonia. Understanding and appreciating this changing epidemiology is important because it's key to ensuring that we prescribe appropriate antibiotics that actually kill the pus. If we're not sure what's causing the infection, we don't know what kinds of antibiotics to use empirically when we're approaching syndromes. There's been a lot of debate about this concept of healthcare-associated pneumonia. There's been very little prospective data to validate it. And in this article by Venditti et al., which was a multi-center study in Italy, they looked at 362 patients in hospital who had some form of pneumonia. What they found was that about 60% of patients had traditional community-acquired pneumonia, a small portion had hospital-acquired pneumonia, but about a quarter had healthcare-associated pneumonia. And they defined healthcare-associated pneumonia as a pneumonia arising in a person who, say, was a dialysis patient, who's been immunosuppressed, recently hospitalized. The standard criteria that identify healthcare-associated infection that are found in the current American Thoracic Society and Infectious Disease Society of America National Guidelines for the Treatment of Hospital-Acquired Endosocomial Pneumonia. When they looked at these patients, beyond just seeing that they fell into different buckets, they actually saw distinctly different outcomes. The patients with healthcare-associated pneumonia had longer lengths of stay, more severe infection, more likely to have multilobar infiltrates, and higher mortality rates than the patients with traditional community-acquired pneumonia. In a logistic regression model looking at independent predictors of mortality, not surprisingly, inappropriate therapy or the prescribing of antibiotics to which the pathogen is resistant was a major risk factor for death. And that's often seen in healthcare-associated pneumonia, particularly in the United States, because we're not considering this syndrome in our patients presenting to the emergency department. We're still grouping them into buckets of community-acquired pneumonia, where we're thinking about pneumococcus, or hospital-acquired pneumonia, where we're thinking about Pseudomonas and MRSA, and we're not capturing that Pseudomonas and MRSA can now be seen in patients presenting to the emergency department. So this really emphasizes the need to sort out these syndromes and not just have two groups, but really three. This data is important because it is, again, prospective validation. It's now from another country outside the U.S. that confirms the concept. The major limitation of this data set, at least as it was presented, was they gave no microbiologic information. They didn't tell you what the pathogens were in this syndrome, and that's important because in Italy, in Southern Europe versus Northern Europe, you see different microbiology because of differential use of antibiotics, and certainly in the U.S. we see very different kinds of pathogens and different susceptibilities than what they see overseas, either in Asia or Europe. And so I still think we're waiting for that, but in the end, this article demonstrates to the clinician the need to not just assume that patients coming through the ER have community-acquired infections, but to really understand your local microbiology and epidemiology. Another article this month, which was in CHEST, or was actually the February issue of CHEST by Don Craven and colleagues, was a review article that actually not looking at ventilator-associated pneumonia, but a new syndrome that they allege exists called ventilator-associated tracheobronchitis. And in this systematic review, they've gone through all the studies that look at ventilator-associated tracheobronchitis and define what VAD is. And they define or propose a definition for ventilator-associated tracheobronchitis that describes a local, localized infection of the tracheobronchial tree in the absence of pneumonia in terms of parenchymal disease or alveolar disease, and it's associated with fever infection, and it does respond to antibiotic therapy. It's clearly felt to be different from just airway colonization because there are signs and symptoms of infection as opposed to just a positive culture. But again, it's not at the other extreme, which would be ventilator-associated pneumonia. They propose that ventilator-associated tracheobronchitis may in fact be its own syndrome and not just a precursor to VAP. And they argue that the literature based on several small randomized trials suggests that we ought to go looking for this syndrome and we ought to treat it with antibiotics because if we do, we may improve outcomes. I think many of us would say that the jury's still out on this because we don't have good diagnostic criteria, we don't have large studies that actually document the epidemiology is very, very distinct from what we see in, say, ventilator-associated pneumonia. So in some ways, we are dealing with ventilator-associated tracheobronchitis the same way we're dealing with healthcare-associated pneumonia, but we're just further along the train of evidence that we have with healthcare-associated pneumonia. 
So I think the jury's still out on ventilator-associated tracheobronchitis. I think it does matter, especially now that Medicare has decided that ventilator-associated pneumonia will be a condition it doesn't want to reimburse for. And so a lot of people are going to allege there's ventilator-associated tracheobronchitis out there. Hence, we ought to have a good definition for what it is. But in the end, we need more validation work here. So in the world of pneumonia, our definitions are changing because we're learning more, because we're seeing the microbiology and epidemiology change. And as a result, we need to change with it, and we need to look at this evidence and figure out how to apply it. This is Andy Shore from the Washington Hospital Center. Have a good day.